From outside, it looks like a standard van. Even the small pie-shaped antenna and cameras on its roof are easy to miss. But inside is specially designed equipment that revolutionises mapping and greatly enhances management and maintenance of the nation's highways. Using satellite positioning signals, researchers from NASA's Center for the Commercial Development of Space in Ohio are producing highly accurate, up-to-date maps simply by driving the streets. Maintaining contact with navigational satellites makes it possible to calculate exactly where the van is at all times, and if the location of the van is known, so is the position of the road it's on. Never before has mapping been so easy or precise. Not only is the information accurate and current, it's also in digital form, meaning it can be processed with computers. This is of tremendous value to government agencies responsible for managing highways. Decisions such as the best route for hazardous cargo can be made far more quickly and reliably. Until now, building an electronic database to support decision-making like this required digitizing existing paper maps, an expensive, time-consuming and imprecise process, and often maps worked from were over 20 years old. Another major benefit of the mobile mapping system is the data that can be obtained about highway features. Project personnel record this information using a touchscreen and standard keyboard. At the same time, digital stereo cameras capture the position and condition of overpasses, signs, utility poles, guardrails, potholes and any other features useful to highway planners. The technology can also be transferred to trains for mapping railways, boats for waterways or aircraft for larger geographic features. The system could even be part of future rovers mapping the surface of the Moon or Mars. Another application is the mapping and documentation of archaeological sites such as these Indian ruins in the southwestern United States. A visual record of this location could be captured in just a few days. The mobile mapping system using signals from space to obtain valuable information about Earth today and other planets in the future. The exhibition Once Upon a Time is made up of pictures sent into space in 1977 and still travelling on the Voyager space probe to let aliens know what life on Earth is like. They're meant to show possible alien life forms what the human race is really like. And now contemporary video filmmaker Steve McQueen has added his own soundtrack to make the images relevant to today. Under the 78 minute film, the sound that's been added is unintelligible voices speaking in tongues. This is the undecipherable language associated with evangelist Christians which marry up with the images perfectly. While the pictures show a sanitized version of mankind, McQueen hopes viewers will find something personal in the work with the added sounds. This breathes new life and understanding into the visions of mankind that were sent into space in the 1970s. Spacecraft have been sent out to explore our solar system. Initially sent to every planet except Pluto, their travels confirmed planetary atmospheres reminiscent of early Earth. Evidence of water, active volcanoes and planetary rings, even giant storms were discovered. Another phase of exploration provided even more in-depth studies. In October 1990, the Ulysses spacecraft began its long journey. It was built by the European Space Agency to learn more about the Sun. Jupiter was the ultimate destination for NASA's Galileo spacecraft. 
After reaching the gaseous planet in late 1995, Galileo deployed a tiny probe to penetrate the atmosphere and radio back data. At the same time, the main orbiter used its complement of 12 onboard experiments to study Jupiter's 16 moons, its atmosphere, radiation and magnetic fields. Travelling to Jupiter required a series of gravity assists, giving the spacecraft a push by visiting Venus once, then Earth twice before making the final leg to Jupiter. This is what Galileo saw when it came within 1,600 miles from Earth on its first pass. Hundreds of images were combined over a 25-hour period to give a view never seen before of the whole Earth in one motion. Images of the Moon were also taken, which included rare glimpses of its far side. Earth's sister planet Venus is similar in size, density and position in the solar system but very different in geology and climate, making it an important candidate for study. In May of 1989, the Atlantis shuttle crew released the spacecraft Magellan on a mission to map the entire surface of Venus. The elegant yet simple mapper carried one instrument, a high-resolution radar that saw through the planet's thick, cloud-choked atmosphere. The bulk of all that mapping was processed here at NASA's Jet Propulsion Laboratory in Pasadena, California. Investigators like Dr. Jim Head, a geologist at Brown University, saw features that set Venus apart from all other planets. The crispness and detail in the photos were incredible, like pieces of modern art, according to the team. Some raw data has also been processed into movies that bring out the desolate, lava-filled landscape making up so much of the Venusian surface. Old areas unspoiled by lava flows are intriguing to investigators because they show little sign of being eroded. The very dense atmosphere keeps the small projectiles that would come in from outer space off the surface, and the very high surface temperature means there's no liquid water. The maps allowed the investigators to see the geological processes that had taken place over millions of years. In the future, as the United States and its international partners continue their planetary exploration, future spacecraft the likes of Ulysses, Galileo and Magellan will play key roles, ultimately leading to a better understanding of our home planet. At the Open University in Milton Keynes, home to the Planetary and Space Sciences Research Institute, some of the world's top scientists dedicate their lives to uncovering the secrets of the universe. But finding the answers to some of the big questions means carrying out years of investigation, often spanning a number of decades. Studying comets, for example, requires long space missions, meaning several generations of researchers are involved. Scientists at the Planetary and Space Sciences Research Institute spend their time unraveling information brought back to Earth from European Space Agency missions. Following in the path of many that have gone before, one spacecraft after another will continue to provide vital information to generations of scientists, past, present and future. Projects carried out in space rely on many craftsmen in multiple fields. One is master glassblower Bob Harris. To him, glass is flexible and practical, providing laboratory hardware for a variety of scientific experiments. Using a lathe, hydrogen burners and carbon tools for shaping, he skillfully works his magic. Harris has been building one-of-a-kind components for spacecraft and laboratory experiments for most of his career.
As a scientific glass blower, Bob has been asked to build just about everything, from glass springs and laser tubes to the main vacuum chamber for an atomic clock. The art of scientific glass blowing is really only learned from watching an expert at work, and that's the way it's been for centuries. Unaffected by most chemicals and able to withstand extreme temperatures, glass is perfect for chemistry hardware. For scientists, the skill and experience of an on-site craftsman provides important design flexibility. Here, a piece of research apparatus begins to take shape. By forcing air into the closed vessel and heating only a tiny area, a blister is formed. Using the torch like a knife, Bob cuts a hole. Tubing is then inserted to form a joint. Once completed, the arm is heated and with a quick bend, it's finished. Collaboration between scientists and craftsmen often extends beyond glass blowing to include the machine shop or optics section. This mirror, two years in the making by the optics lab, is being checked for surface imperfection. Delicate glass sculptures have been created for exhibits as well as for national and international leaders to represent NASA's space achievements. Each of them carefully constructed using techniques perfected through years of scientific work. Serenely beautiful from 93 million miles away, the sun is actually a violently energetic system. So complex that scientists from NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center are dedicating their careers to its study. Working at the Kitt Peak National Observatory outside Tucson, Arizona, they use a variety of telescopes in their research. This instrument on Kitt Peak is the largest solar telescope in the world. An 81-inch mirror on its roof tracks the sun's daily passage, sending a beam down a shaft extending 300 feet below ground. The result is a unique high-resolution image of the sun about two and a half feet in diameter. The researchers hope to get at the causes of solar activity by determining what's going on in the sun's interior. Their ultimate goal is to accurately predict the violent solar activity that's troublesome to us all on Earth. Most of the work is done in this 81-foot high solar vacuum telescope. Again, mirrors are used to reflect an image of the sun down into the instrument's control room. Here, a daily map of magnetic phenomenon on the sun's surface is produced. Nearly all forms of solar activity, from sunspots to flares, create magnetic fields. If these disturbances are strong enough, communications on Earth can be disrupted. There may even be a relationship between solar activity and earthly temperatures. At NASA's Marshall Space Flight Center in Huntsville, Alabama, scientists study the sun with X-ray telescopes. This mirror was part of an instrument used on Skylab to produce solar images. Today, Hoover and scientists from Stanford University are working with a new generation of X-ray telescope, and they're producing phenomenally high-resolution images, revealing solar turbulence as never seen before. Launched in 1980, the 5,500-pound Solar Maximum spacecraft provided a great deal of information about the Sun. And since being repaired by NASA's astronauts, its instruments still continue to run.
When the shuttle lifted off in October 1990, it carried within its cargo bay another spacecraft designed to take an even closer look at the Sun. Developed by NASA and the European Space Agency, Ulysses flew over the solar poles, regions of the Sun which hold important clues about its nature. Ulysses' long journey of exploration, together with SolarMax and discoveries being made by NASA scientists around the world, will greatly enhance our understanding of the fiery beast behind the beauty. As launch time approaches, anxious scientists and their families nervously await liftoff. Blasting off from Kazakhstan, the Russian Soyuz rocket safely takes off for the European Space Agency's cluster mission, a day later than scheduled and four years after the first mission tragically blew up on launch. The mission will last for two years and will be investigating the complex relationship between the Earth and the Sun. Four satellites are currently working in space on this mission. The satellites are linked and travel in a wide orbit around the Earth together, gathering information. The nuclear powerhouse that is the Sun is constantly shooting streams of electrically charged particles into space. When this solar wind crashes into the Earth's magnetic field, the magnetosphere, it can break through, damaging orbiting communication satellites and affecting the weather. It's possible to see these solar particles as the aurora borealis, the shimmering lights in the sky near the Earth's magnetic poles. Interest was high as the four satellites of the cluster mission began beaming back data from this cosmic battle zone hundreds of kilometres above our heads. The most exciting thing was that with the early data, scientists were able to confirm some of the theories they had, but they were also able to see phenomena which hadn't been expected, things that were different from what the theory said they should be. The Aurora Borealis, the Northern Lights, are the most visible sign of solar weather hitting the Earth's magnetic shield. But cluster should give earlier warnings of solar storms, which can seriously disrupt the space-borne communication systems on which we now rely so heavily. Classes start early for pupils at Star City, the cosmonaut training center outside of Moscow. Complex space flight theory is combined with Russian language tuition for Dutch astronaut Andre Kuepers ahead of the Delta mission to the International Space Station. Although interpreters are used at the space center, the crew need to be able to understand the ground staff once inside the Soyuz spacecraft. Mock versions of the Soyuz TMA are used to train would-be cosmonauts. The Dutch astronaut learns everything from how to deal with the electrical systems or set up experiments to making food. After the technical training, Kuepers is tested to make sure he is medically fit enough to endure space flight. Inside the hyperbaric chamber, the Dutch astronaut sits in a simulated, high-altitude, low-pressure environment. With cooling lines and an oxygen supply, the suit will keep its shape if pressure suddenly drops inside the Soyuz. A medical team also monitors his performance under intense centrifugal forces as well as simulated weightlessness training sessions where astronauts are taught how to move in a zero-gravity environment. Here Kuepers struggles with his training suit during one simulated weightlessness situation. The astronaut then needs to prepare for worst-case scenarios. He is taught to leave the spacecraft should it veer off course and land underwater. Luckily, when it came to mission time, he didn't need the emergency training. The 
the Dutch astronaut returned to Earth safely with other returning astronauts and cosmonauts. Imagine flying aboard the space shuttle. The main engines fire, then with a powerful jolt, the solid rocket motors ignite. The acceleration and intense pull of gravity during ascent is tremendous, but when the main engines cut off and the shuttle reaches orbit, the crew enter a totally new environment. And in this weightless environment, about three quarters of first time space travelers feel ill. To help counter this, NASA has developed a pre-flight training regime for the astronauts. They have a neurosciences laboratory at the Johnson Space Center, which is responsible for studying the human body's condition in space. They can also develop better systems to maximize the astronauts' performance. Shuttle missions lasted normally for about 10 days, but if staying on the International Space Station, they are months long. This is when it becomes critical that the effects of the weightless environment are minimized. It becomes even more important when we consider trips to Mars and beyond, which means traveling in low or no gravity for months or even years. The spherical trainer is used to emulate similar sensory conditions to those experienced during spaceflight. Large overhead projectors display a montage of computer-generated patterns that fill the subject's field of view. It is the movement of these patterns that eventually fools the subject into thinking that he or she is moving, not the image. Once it is exposed to a variety of pre-programmed visual cues, the brain can recalibrate itself, in this case, like one that is found in space. The human body is very versatile and adaptable, being capable of conforming to many environments, even space. When members of the Skylab 4 crew returned to Earth after nearly three months in orbit, their first steps were tenuous. And they did readapt, but it took time. Today, when astronauts return from space, they undergo evaluations so that researchers can better understand this process. Over the next decade, this research will be critical in better preparing man's long-term commitment to space.